There's been so much talk over the last few years about the push into ESG, particularly on the E side of that equation. I guess the big question that a lot of people really want to know is sort of what are the components for investing in that space? So I think everyone's different version of ESG. I believe in ESG 2.0, which to me is at the intersection of materiality and authenticity. I focus particularly on the energy transition because I think it's the most impactful. I also really focus on holding my companies accountable. I call it carbon accountability. So we are active in our approach and I engage with management teams and I say to them, break out your CapEx. Let me see what you are spending on decarbonization and where. And then I wanna see your carbon footprint and did it go down? I.e., how good are you at allocating capital when it comes to reducing your carbon footprint? Because any CEO can tell you they're gonna be carbon neutral by 2050. The reality is they're not going to be there. So are you on the right trajectory and are you on pace to hit your goals? Do you think that the metrics are there right now to accurately and fairly assess how these companies are making progress toward that goal? No, which is why I came up with my own proprietary method called carbon accountability. Absolutely not. Um, but that is also an opportunity. And, you know, in terms of the energy transition, I think the value investors way to play this is through the green metals. Um, I get Tesla-like growth at a commodity like multiple. Mm -hmm. And if I go to places like Canada, I don't have to take on the geopolitical risk of other regions. But when you go to a country like Canada, what you are faced with uniquely or less uniquely um, increasingly is a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. So in Canada, companies pay $40 per ton today, and that goes up by $15 every year until it hits 170 So the first net carbon zero copper and nickel mine, Foran and Canada Nickel, which are both in our fund, will never pay that carbon tax. And to me, that makes that company so much more valuable because it, the discounted cash flows are higher. Mm -hmm. And so this is what I mean about companies that are using their CapEx to innovate and decarbonize as having a real edge. And you know, so this is where I treat carbon as an asset. Um, and not a liability. Well, explain that a little bit more here, because I think for a lot of folks who aren't uh, as knowledgeable about this as you are, they hear carbon as an asset and they sort of scratch their head. What, what does that mean? Yeah, so effectively, carbon is very valuable because 61% of the world's countries and 20% of the largest listed companies in the world, representing 14 trillion in sales, have made commitments to decarbonize. There are some industries that can't get there, Right? This is unobtainable without carbon credits. So you have an asymmetric demand supply for carbon credits. So carbon credits are increasingly going up in price. And to me, this is climate capitalism. This is where carbon becomes a currency and an asset, not a liability for the best players. There are a lot of people that look at, let's just take your turn of phrase, climate capitalism. There are investors who will say, all I care about is just maximizing my, maximizing my profits. It doesn't really matter how these companies make money as long as they're doing it legal. That's all they want. What's the shift in investor sentiment right now amongst the universe of, universe of people that you interact with with regards to their attention to climate change and their attention, more importantly, to how companies can profit and prosper in a world where we are moving, I guess, towards lower carbon emissions? Really interesting question because there are countries that mandate you reduce your carbon footprint, but there are also companies that are doing it voluntarily, such as the cruise ships, because it increasingly it's your social license to operate. People care. Uh, and, and if your customer cares, it's ultimately going to impact your share price. So this is this is definitely a shift, Romaine, um, and, it, and it's for the better. It's for the better. You mentioned some of the countries out there. I mean, there's a pretty wide disparity in carbon pricing on country to country, of course, in terms of regulation, country to country. We've seen some of the Nordic nations kind of out in front on this. The EU has uh, played a little bit of catch up, but they're now starting to push to the forefront. But then you look at some of the I guess, more traditional developed nations in the Western Hemisphere, and they seem to be kind of behind the curve. Yeah, so different countries have different pricing. So, for example, in the EU, it's over $100 a ton right now. In California, the price goes up by 5% plus inflation every year. So different governments can mandate different pricing schemes, but there's also the voluntary market. And that is where um, you list a carbon credit and companies buy them 
um, on a voluntary basis. So a royal, like a Royal Caribbean cruise ship, right? They, they're not regulated under any government system, but they offset their carbon pr footprint. Mm -hmm. So that establishes there's a lot of demand for carbon credits. The other thing, Romaine, that I think is misunderstood is the supply. Why is there this demand supply imbalance? How do you create a carbon credit? And there are basically two ways. You can either do reforestation, where, for example, you take a mangrove and you restore it because a hurricane hit it. And just to put some numbers on this, because I think that's always helpful, in the Bahamas, where I'm from, we have 7,011 hectares of restorable mangroves. If we were to restore them, that would be worth $308 million in terms of uh, carbon credits. Mm -hmm. That's that's reforestation. The other way is afforestation, where you take the carbon sequestration properties of, let's stick with the mangroves and seagrass example, and you get it accredited by someone like Gold Standard and you registered it with the UNFCC, and then you can sell those. And in the Bahamas, for example, if you were to do that, we have 97,000 acres of mangroves mm -hmm. and 5.4 million hectares of seagrass. That would be worth $375 million a year every year. That's impressive. If a company goes down that road, though, how do you verify it? How do investors know that what those companies say they're doing there is actually being done? So you typically have someone who um, assign, looks at the project and ass assesses it, and then someone independently audits it. So you can have a company like Synergy who designs the project, and then Gold Standard is the gold standard in the industry, um, comes in and audits it. And so is there a precedent for this Romaine, right? We're talking about you see the carbon sequestration property of natural resources. And the answer is yes. There's one country in the world that has done it, and it is Gabon. And the buyer of that carbon sequestration carbon credit was Norway. And they raised $150 million. So this is, again, where I'm talking about climate capitalism, where, you're at, where your carbon can be an asset, and it can also be a currency. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to get into that. So because you get paid as a country on your net carbon footprint, so you want to get your net score down. How do you do that? In a country like the Bahamas, where 100% of the energy is generated by fossil fuels, the obvious answer would be to install solar. The obvious problem is how do you pay for it? This is not a rich country. Um, and here is where I think the innovation is, 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 is going to be amazing. In terms of, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Royal Caribbean was trying to offset their carbon footprint. They committed to buy every megawatt of power a wind farm in Kansas generated. Well, let's follow that yellow brick road. What is a cruise ship doing with a wind farm in landlocked Kansas? It turns out it was not the craziest idea. They, um, so they, they fund, basically gave a power purchasing agreement for a 200 megawatt farm, which in return generates 512,000 carbon credits for Royal Caribbean for the next 12 years annually. And if they were to buy that in the open market at $25 a ton, that would cost them $12.8 million. Hmm. So Southwestern, which is the energy company, right. got their wind financed and Royal Caribbean got carbon credits. Um, and so that is a model that is typical in company financing that can be applied to countries to finance their energy transition. Mm -hmm. And for island nations and everyone, the energy transition represents energy independence. And the reason that is so important, Romaine, is a country like this spends a billion dollars in fossil fuels every year, has 10 billion in debt, an 86% debt to GDP ratio, and a B plus credit rating. If we could be energy independent, it would be a role model for every other island nation. We could solve our balance of payment problem pay down our debt, meet our, our carbon reduction goals with the UN and the rest of the CARICOM, and start a sovereign wealth fund. This is game changing. It is, it's very, very exciting. And I think it's hope for you know, a brand new green day for, for island nations.